I'm Jeff Cornwall and this is The Entrepreneurial Mind. Today our guest is George Grun of Grun Guitars. We'll be back after a moment. Healthcare reform has generated over 15,000 pages of regulations filled with increased complexity, compliance, and cost for your business. You could spend the time and money to figure it out or you can trust Insperity to handle it for you with one stroke of the pen. We are ready for health care reform. Are you? Talkopolis, the social media TV network for your city. So, George, um, in this first segment, we, I think we're going to have probably three segments with you on this. Um, let's talk a little bit about the history of, of Groom Guitar. You started the business in 1970, if I remember right? We opened up in January of 70. But the concept to open a store was earlier. Even back uh, in 1969, I had done an interview with a bluegrass magazine, Mule Skinner Blues, and they asked me what some of my ideas that I wanted to do were. And I told them that I had in mind opening up a music store. So were you a bluegrass musician at the time? Or? I really have never called myself a musician. My lifetime earnings playing music from 63 to the present is now up to $42. <laughs> and that's, Sounds like my book royalties. Well, that's on seven occasions collectively that I add up to that. And I'm counting things like I was at a guitar Tip show. <laughs> yes. Yeah, not deliberately so, but if I was at a guitar show and I took a guitar out of a case and looked at it and strummed a few chords and somebody walked by and threw a quarter in the case. I'm counting <laughs> that. But at any rate, what I do is a hobby that got out of hand. I never really originally started with any thought that I'd be either a musician or a music merchant. My academic background is all in zoology and psychology, animal behavior ethology. I did my undergraduate work at the University of Chicago in ethology, psychology department, animal behavior studies. I did graduate work in zoology at Duke. And then I did some further graduate work in the psychology department, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, with a professor that I knew when he was a graduate student at University of Chicago and I was an undergraduate. But I had an interest in the music scene. And at the University of Chicago, they had the Folklore Society, and they had similar corresponding groups at University of Wisconsin in Madison, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. There was an active scene in Greenwich Village, and there was an active scene in the most similar community in the country, except it was at the opposite end, Berkeley. You know, you could go from one to the other, and it was the society was the same, except the scene was different. But I very quickly developed an addiction for collecting guitars. And I was more into collecting them than I was into either being a great player or trying to be a businessman. But what I found is that back in those early pre-internet days, 63, 64, there obviously was no internet and there was no eBay or Craigslist or anything like that, but newspapers back then had real classified ads and every day I would get the Chicago Sun-Times and Tribune and I'd read those classifieds and I'd call lots of people tracking down instruments and there were pawn shops and walking distance and Every day I was checking That's them. where I got my first guitar was at a pawn shop. I had an addiction. And after a while, it got to the point where first I had to have a guitar every month, and soon I had to have one every week. And it eventually got to the point, if I hadn't had a guitar that day, I was going to have withdrawal symptoms. But I was not collecting at the rate of a guitar a day. What I found is that when I went in pawn shops, music stores, or looked at the classifieds, I'd be 
looking for a narrow range of things that I really wanted. I wanted pre-World War II Martin flat top guitars. I wanted to find a Gibson F5 mandolin that was made from 1922 to 1924 with Lloyd so Lohr. How did you discover um, all these nuanced and esoteric little instruments. I mean, how did you learn that business? Well, there were no books or articles to speak of available at that time, but there were people in the folklore society who were interested in collecting and were very sophisticated in their knowledge of the vintage old-timey music. And I learned a lot of that from word of mouth from them. And also I tracked down people who worked at some of these companies. And back then in 64, 63, you know, you go back 30 years, and that was uh, 63, you go back 30 years, that's 1933, that's the height of the Depression, and, or the depth, either way you want to so call it, but the point is, it's pe there were people alive and well who could tell me about this, and I learned, I was interested, and I started collecting insects when I was four years old. I was collecting frogs and turtles by the Here time collect, I was six. You collect snakes now, too, from what I understand. I got my first snake when I was eight. I've had snakes longer than guitars, but I was, by the time I was 12, I was reading Copia, the Journal of the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists. But the point is, I knew about the Linnaean taxonomic system before I got to high school. And today, and then too, I looked at the instruments very much the same as the way I look at zoological specimens. In my mind, I organize them in a Linnaean taxonomic system. The books that I've been co-authoring and articles that I've written, they're organized like a zoological field guide. And the way I approach the business and the instruments, both, is very much as though they are a living organism. And if you do this, you can, using that basic scientific framework, you can store a lot of knowledge up here. It works better when you put them in a pattern right. than when you try to memorize hundreds of unrelated random facts. It works so much better in patterns. And live animals are organized in patterns. That's the way the universe for the scientist, whether it's physics, chemistry, or biology, it's in an organized system. Or guitars. Or guitars or business. Right. My business is a living organism. Right. All the people in this room, you and me and everybody else we know, has a body that's a lot bigger than our head. Political cartoons are the other way around, usually. You know, it's commonly said that new businesses fail in the first two or three years, and the answer is always they're undercapitalized. That's not true. Right. They fail not because of undercapitalization. They're not constructed like a live organism. They don't have the organ systems in place. Some organ systems are entirely missing, like cartoons don't need a colon. They don't need kidneys. They don't need a pancreas. They certainly don't need a lymphatic system, but we do. We wouldn't survive a day without them. And things have to be in the right proportion. They have to function in my business. The showroom downstairs that most of the public sees is no more than a third of the space. And I can tell people, we have three floors. They say, really? I say, yeah, you go outside, you go. There's three. The previous building had four. Yep, yep there's four. And people were amazed. I mean, people who are intelligent, educated people would come in. They'd see the downstairs showroom. They'd talk to somebody like me. And then if I mentioned that we have three or four floors, they acted like, wow, how could that be? Well, how could it be without it? It would be like trying to have the talking head survive without the body. So talk about the decision to open that store. When, you know, that, that's a big step. Um, well, it was and it wasn't. It didn't have a fancy schmancy business plan. In fact, I've never had a fancy business plan. I was collecting. And like I said, for every one I'd find that I wanted to keep, be like the prospector who goes through 200 tons of gravel and they pan the gravel and sift it and sift it and sift it and every time they find a lump of gold, they put it here. And if they run across a 
piece of copper. They don't want it, but it's a pain in the ass, but you already found it, so you put it there. And you pan more and you find a lump of turquoise. You put it there. And at the end of the month, you got 200 tons of cleaned gravel that some contractor will pay you for. And you got four tons of copper and you got a similar amount of turquoise. And you make one. You got a quarter ounce of gold. You don't even have enough to make one ring. You find you're a hobbyist gold miner. That's how I got into business. And it accumulated. My college dorm room had a few guitars. And then the next year I shared an apartment with another student and my bedroom was filled with snakes and guitars. I was doing a research project on feeding behavior of pit vipers. We had them in the animal lab at the university. Must have been a challenge to find a roommate. Well, yeah, but he, that was easier than when I had the animals in the lab at the university after the department heads, ch the chairman of the department's wife found out that there were venomous snakes in the building and she wouldn't go in anymore. They told me I had to take them home. So I had about 25 cotton mouths in cages in my bedroom along with guitars and me. I had more, I had more room for snake cages than I did for my stuff. And, but in graduate school, I had an apartment of my own. I had a three-room apartment. And I had one room that was piled high with guitars. And then one day, I got a call. Hank Williams, Jr. called me. He said Sonny Osborne from the Opry had told him that I had a lot of guitars. And I sold some. And I said, yes. I started telling him a few of what I had. And he says, you know, I can be there in four hours. Well, this was 1968. There was no interstate highway between right. Nashville. It was Tulane winding roads on the Cumberland Plateau, but he showed up in four hours. He was driving a Jaguar E. It would haul ass, it wouldn't haul a lot of guitars. And I was going to say it wouldn't hold much of a guitar. No, it no. wouldn't. And the other thing is, amazingly enough, he got there without having a British trained mechanic with him because they don't have, a, you know, those things didn't have a reputation right. for being reliable. But he brought one guitar with him that he wanted to trade. He bought, th he traded and bought three guitars. And it was all that the, his car would haul. And he said, you know, I could be back tomorrow with a bigger car. And that seemed, you know, sure. So the next day he showed up in a Cadillac Eldorado and he, I sold him enough that he could fill his car. And I was not selling him my very best ones. I was keeping the Model 45 Pearl trimmed Martins pre-war for me. And I was selling others to finance my habit, my addiction. But after the second day, he said, you know, Nashville doesn't have anybody like you. And if you ever want to set up a music store and you come to Nashville, I'll have an apartment waiting for you and I'll help you set up a store. Well, I was getting disenchanted with the academic scene. So I said, that's a good idea. I dropped out and I moved to Nashville and he had the apartment waiting. And then he said, well, you know, you ought to live here a while and get to know the town before we actually set up a store. You don't even know where to put it and whatever. And that's sort of reasonable up to a point. But at no point did he ever help me start a music store. And that's why he and I can still be good friends today because A, we didn't go into business together and B, he didn't loan me money. The best ways to quickly lose friends right. are going to business with them or loan them money. There's right. some rare cases when it works, but a lot of times it just doesn't. But I was in Nashville. I was wheeling and dealing out of my apartment. Hank was my best customer. We were still on very good terms and still are. But it got to the point where the apartment was getting f more and more and you more need a filled. store to, to keep all the space or to keep the all insurance the company told me they'd <coughs> refuse to renew my insurance because I had too much stuff in an apartment that even to get the I had to change the doors on the apartment even when I moved in to get a policy at all. We put solid doors, you know, apartments had those flimsy right. doors, and the landlord let me put in solid doors. I paid for them, but they were solid doors with good deadbolt locks. And But it's still, they canceled my policy when it got to having too much money. So I had to do something, so I opened up a store. And so why do I have a store? Well, it's sort of like, how did I get into collecting? It's a hobby that got out of hand. 
and here it is still. Well, when we come back, um, I want to talk a little bit more about the present. And so uh, uh, we'll be back uh, with our next episode soon. Bandwidth for today's show is brought to you by SoftLayer.com. We love SoftLayer here at Talkopolis. They are the greatest hosting company ever. They make everything easy. Check out their website at SoftLayer.com. Thanks again for sponsoring the show.